Okay, record on this computer. And we are recording. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to Toulouse. No, good afternoon to Toulouse. Good evening, good afternoon to Sweden. Yep. And close to lunch for Ron. Okay, so so uh, let's let's uh, get, make our tour first of all. Go around. Um, how is everybody doing? Ron, how are you doing? Thank you for the uh, the debugging session yesterday after the the trip. Well, I'm doing fine. Uh, well, seems like I always give the weather report. I don't know, but uh, I guess I will. The uh, it's gonna it's overcast. It's gonna rain later. Uh, the and the overweening uh, point is that it's overweening. No, that's the wrong word. But anyway, it's it's been on. Unusually warm for most of the winter here in Chicago. It's really like record breaking and persistently warm. And for a few years, we kind of had the kind of the reverse backlash of global warming or something because it was colder here because of, I don't know, the polar vortex and the El Nino and, or not, and I don't know. But this year it really caught up with us and it's plants are blooming and everything, and I hope we don't have a big freeze. Right. So that's my weather report. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we had a vortex here too. And uh, now, like in Chicago, it's extremely warm today. we will be a 15 to 20 degrees centigrade. It's crazy. New vocabulary, new weather patterns. Yeah. Something to explore. Great. How are you doing, Fleming? So how are you doing there? I'm fine. I went for a bicycle ride and I went and dug in the garden. I'm, I'm trying to bring a new conduit into the house for my fiber optic connection. Oh, that's right. Um, How's that going? Well, they they failed twice in doing it. Like the, the phone people have shown up twice and at first they couldn't find the box in the garden where the phone cable was connected. I finally found that and I thought that would be it, but then they couldn't get from that box into the house. Uh, so now I've been digging to find out how it comes into the house and probably will lay another conduit from that box and going up the wall and into my office, which is on the first floor. So I'll actually take it all the way in there. Uh, I'm, I might hire the the guy, the last guy who came to like drill the actual holes and stuff and make put the actual conduit. But I've been doing the creating a trench from the border of the property all the way over to the house, so it's just laying down the conduit. So that has taken a little bit of digging, which was and a little bit of a discovery process to find out where that actually went underground and what's uh, and what's there. So. It's kind of fun. Good. Can't wait to see Fleming in, in gigabit bandwidth quality. Super HD. Yeah, I'm yeah, not sure you'd HD. want to. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks, Fleming. John, how are you doing? And no clipping? Uh, fine. It's... Um had a kind of a productive day. I mean, having a productive day with you as well, so it, that's, that's not that much of a difference. Uh, so, I mean, the weather is kind of typical Swedish, kind of almost um, snow, but not quite, uh, actually a bit milder than usual for this sort of February, March thing. Um, whether it's global warming or not, or whether we actually do have vortexes or not, remains to be known. Uh, in terms of me as some kind of a vortex, the, the conversation community has sort of leveled up again, which is annoying when it happens. But then after a couple of days, it's usually good. So it's, I just wish the conversation community would tell me when it does that, but it doesn't. It's just, it's just sort of one of those self-organizing vortexes or vortices or whatever it's called in English. Um, but other than that, mm, uh, well, 
I am cranking away at those card sessions, right? Uh, the third one, and the recent one, is kind of Sandys as a service, enactment support systems, which kind of a stretch to use in group creativity card deck for that. But I do have an idea or two why I'm torturing that poor card deck to perform additional duty. It's kind of like Fleming, kind of to actually just finding a line of inquiry and rope path and see where the hell it actually goes or appears or, well, depending on whatever direction you're tracing things, right? So, I mean, enactment is kind of, we're mostly there, right, with the, the stuff we're doing. Support system, well, if Alice had sort of signed up on the spot and her old research institution as a paying client, then our support system had been working brilliantly. But we'll get there, right? So um, I have sort of good hopes that there will be some nice convergences and possible opportunities for us later on this year. But I mean, things happen when they happen, right? When, when people show up when they show up and then it starts when it starts and it ends when it ends and possibly there's some coffee and tea in between. So it's kind of all good. So, uh, yeah. Good to know. Good to know, John. No, so, I, mean, I, mean, I can fill in on more technical details on, on the card session, but it's basically just drawing a card at random and then say something moderately intelligent about it in the comments. So it's, that's yeah, basically your set. Right? Let's, let's get to that a little later, John. Yeah, um, we can sort of do that later, yeah. I do want to start with the debriefing of uh, the, the session yesterday with, with Alice, right? With Alice uh, Shiriko. Um, let, let me start putting in a few words and then let me get your reactions, responses. Um, what, what you thought went well, what needs improvement. So of course, um, that was a tour where we had, you wanna pick up Fleming? No, I don't even use this phone, so nobody should be calling me. I don't know how to <laughs> stop it. <laughs> um, well, damn. The secret direct line to Fleming. Well, it's to have an Android phone because to test certain things, but nobody should be calling me on it. But anyway, <laughs> there you go. Speaking of glitches, right? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> a secret call from a stranger. Yeah, so that was the tour of glitches yesterday. Um, and uh, it started with, actually, Alice ended up in the wrong story verse. Um, this happens when, uh, you know, by accident, she had visited before and looked at some of the examples we had out there. Um, and uh, that didn't update when she was uh, entering the story from the gate, from the departure gate. So she moved into this other story verse and then I had to find her there and said, hey, we're over here and then uh, pulled her back into the current one. So that was just one of the many glitches out there, um, which is pretty interesting to me. It's like, uh, me feeling like running around and trying to locate the people and bringing them back into the story itself, you know, is a story, right? It's like, this is already starting as an inaction. And John is very good at this, right? So pulls that in and uh, makes it part of the story. So one of the glitches there, uh, obviously some others um, because of this metric system and uh, because of uh, Ron's avatar not showing, that I have figured out now, it's, it has to do with Facebook, um, blocking the URL for the photos after a while. They, they simply expire and they're not being refreshed for some reason. Um, and that's a common bug. Um, uh, other people have the same problem. Um, Google, Google doesn't do that, um, but it's only Facebook who just expires these, these photo URLs. So I suggest for the coming uh, knowledge expeditions, always log in under the uh, the Google account that you have there, right? You have these four options. So just use Google, log in, do the allow thing, and then that avatar is always visible. It never expires. I've, I've, I've always used Facebook. It seems to have worked with me. Um, not that I doubt your explanation, but it, it's uh, so far it has seemed okay. Yeah, it will. Me too in the past. Yeah, it will expire. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. Um, they allow it for a couple of weeks and then randomly just drop it. 
Um, so for some reason, on Ron's end, it happened much earlier. Um, but uh, the good news is for new guests, right, if they arrive, they can still choose Facebook because it's the first time they're coming in and that URL should be valid for the first time and it stays valid for a couple of days. So we keep <clears throat> good there. Um, but for repeat visits and for us, um, we, we should use the, the Google account. It's, it's better. Okay, so overall my impression, you know, from Alice, um, obviously it took a while to get started. Uh, so we had a lot of back and forth, but uh, she was there and I, I felt there was some good resonance um, and uh, she was able to step through the, the story beats. Um, and uh, what what was missing in action, obviously, because we were all over the place, uh, like Ron couldn't log in or couldn't click on the action buttons, and uh, John was, you know, behind and then coming back into the story. Um, so we didn't have a, a real conversation going, and I think that's something that that uh, was noticeable. Um, because if you have everybody in the same story point, and we're talking to each other, talking together that makes for much stronger experience. And, and kind of this was a bit missing. So we had the, the story kind of aligned, you know, as usual, but um, we didn't have that strong coherence that we usually create when um, we're all there and we're talking to each other. Um, even like when we enter the, the fame on airstream, usually John serves uh, the Swedish muffins, right? And uh, we couldn't get to that because John wasn't there. I served the muffins, but it was a little bit rushed too because I wanted to get through the story um, before she had to leave at uh, at uh, six o'clock her time or five o'clock her time, um, and uh, so so that felt a bit rushed too on my end uh, to get to move the story forward and to, to finish it, and then didn't have time for for a hangout at the end that that was missing too. Um, but uh, at least overall, I think she got a good impression. Um, she sent me an email this morning, said uh, she wanted to talk about it. Um, I couldn't talk to her this morning, which I plan to do maybe in the next couple of days. Um, he's starting a couple of email exchanges with her and see what the next steps are with, with them. That's something I'm not sure yet how to position that and say, hey, is that going to be a real project for you guys or is it just for you looking and it's interesting and let's move on. So that's something I wanted to discuss with you too today. Um, how should we progress with with them? Right. But so that's my overall impression here. Let's let's go around. What do you what did you think? First thing that comes to mind for whatever I don't know. It's the first thing that came to mind is that I'm personally and along the lines we're traveling for a long time. I've been. Pretty, very interested, kind of preoccupied with the, the health and education side of it. So that just comes to mind. And there, the Milan group is pretty strongly into health, the health side of the mental health and so forth. So that's the next thing that comes to mind. And I'm not sure where to proceed from with that. <laughs> But those are the first things that came to my head and came out of my mouth. Maybe there's some way to proceed. Uh, I mean, it's already included in a sense. I mean, we, we kind of know where they're at in that regard. And, or maybe they don't know as much about where we're at in that regard. Maybe that's the point. By gosh, I finally found a point. <laughs> no, that's a good starting point, Ron. Let me, let me take a note here and, and uh, mention that too when I reach out to her. Oh. Good. Anything about the expedition, Ron? I mean, you you were lost at many points in the story, right? So the whole story immersion didn't work. Um, for, the follow buttons for us did for not you. work. The follow buttons didn't work. How did we get to the next story point then? At some point, at, I've, for a couple times, I have got to it by hovering over the avatars to get the name of the location, and then I used the go command. Oh, I see. That's how you, 
I showed up again later. If it hadn't been for that, I just would have been stuck at whatever, <clears throat> wherever I was. Because at each stage, I tried the buttons and they didn't work. My goodness, right. <clears throat> I wonder how she moved forward then. <clears throat> well, some buttons apparently were working. She didn't. She didn't seem to have a problem. She was the first to follow. So uh, finally, when she got in the right place, it seemed to work well for her. Okay. And you were follow buttons were working, right, Fleming? Uh, well, I was having some trouble too. I sort oh. of had to press them oh. twice or something. Um, it's, you know, when you push a button a little harder, then it works a little better. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that used to be true of truly mechanical switches. Well, with with more intention than <laughs> I yeah. wanted to move on, so I, I pushed through anyway. It, that can work. Good. My new tactile sensory input device is working. I have to find <laughs> Oh, yeah, the in, in, intent o meter. <laughs> Your tent on meter is too weak. You gotta raise it a little, and you'll be fine. There's a good point. Yeah. So leave. So leave some obstacles for everybody, and the people who really want to get through, who will make it despite all the obstacles that we program for them, they they score really high on the intentiometer. Good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Ron. So, Fleming, what do you think about? Well, I think it went well despite the various difficulties. But it, I mean, it maybe kept me a little bit from feeling really immersed in it because I care about that everybody should work for everybody kind of thing. Uh, but I mean, the main guest, Alice, seemed to enjoy it. She seemed to have a good time. Um, so, and and also it brings up various things for me of, uh, like I mentioned several times, like if there's some way of making it feel less of a problem when there's a problem, like, like if there's some things that always work or there's always something you can do so one doesn't feel sort of left out or you didn't make it to the next step with everybody else. So you're like an outcast kind of thing. Like if somehow it can become a feature rather than just a bug that somehow, or it could be part of the setup that is just part of the presentation that whatever happens is fine. I mean, there's no way of failing at it. Even if you stayed on the first screen, there were there somehow it's an experience and there's something to do. Uh, so one way of doing that could be that there's maybe some, there are several technologies at the same time and we're maybe sure that one of them at least will work. So uh, if you can't click on the follow button, then maybe, maybe the chat would still work or something like that. Or, or you can, or you're in the Zoom or something, or, or you make notes on a piece of paper, just just so that everybody knows that whatever adventure they ended up on is sort of okay. That that would give it a that would reframe any kind of bug. So it's not like oh, it, we wasted twenty minutes on getting everybody in the same place. Where rather it could be wow, for twenty minutes we were like all in a hall of mirrors and we discovered new interesting things. And if we can re recount our different adventures from that, and it actually adds value to it rather than being oh it took a while yeah. to get going kind of thing <laughs> so part of it is how we think about it i think but we could think of having sort of fallback technologies when one doesn't work well you, there's something else you probably can do that's good. Um, so some redundancy i like that yeah yeah, yeah. Where fa failure I'm, is not personally, I'm not personally yeah. uh don't know what to do technologically about that it sure sounds good though and uh also, in Alice's case specifically, I, I, mean, I don't know what the conversations have been with her totally, but maybe she would understand it or could understand it as just kind of an invitation to a rehearsal. So, you know, anything could happen. It's, we're just working on stuff. You know, what you want to take a look at what we're doing. Yeah, and she's, I mean, they're used to playing with technologies. I mean, she, she wouldn't be thrown off by that something takes a while to set up or it's not working in the first try. That, that shouldn't be... All that I think she's also a performer. 
And she said, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was looking, we were waiting around. I found her SoundCloud page. She's a wonderful yep. singer. Yep. Hmm. Cool. Great. Thanks, Fleming. Yeah, that's, that's good. And that's good to yep. position it as a rehearsal. I love that. That's, that's a great way to invite people into this experience, right? It's more of a, just a conversational or a psychological setup. It's not a very technical thing. No, no, that's and that's I don't important. Know what you can do with, uh -huh. yeah. Cool. And just, just the thing, like just like I call my things experiments, that gives you sort of a, a safeguard that nobody can say that it went wrong because it was an experiment. So I mean, an experiment can't go wrong. Maybe you don't get what you <laughs> expected, but it, it's never you did it. <laughs> so it, it could be the same kind of thing that it's sort of like an, we shouldn't call it's it an, an attempt. Though. We can yeah. use some wording that makes it all right, no matter what happens. So. I mean, well, Fleming, but Fleming, if there's a complete catastrophe, you could always say we're just exploring a slightly more div divergent possibility space. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you go that case. So, I mean, exploring <laughs> already has it, and a possibility yeah. space. Yeah, so there you yeah. go. <laughs> Most participants uh, made it through, right? more or less unscathed. Uh, but I mean, actually, I I found it. Uh, one of the more uh, immersive experiences. Suddenly I was there, kind of me trying to juggle, and eventually further, a bit in, I realized that there was something with my browser memory. I had basically had one gazillion browser tabs open before, and I should never do that. Basically generalized into, you should, thou shalt never ever use Google Plus or Facebook as tabs, <laughs> which is, Bit of a problem for me because I do tend to use some of those tabs now and then. Uh, but anyway, so browser memory was, I don't know, some tabs had eaten all the memory, right? So when I pressed hi to Alice, I could, right? So that ate the last kilobyte and then I had to wait <laughs> five minutes for that particular expedition browser tab to actually come unfrozen again. And I think that was in uh, the Sagamata Cafe or somewhere. Uh, so I could sort of technically actually use the chat. I, I used to realize that there will be hell to pay if I do that more than once, right? So um, that was interesting because the cards worked. They, they worked perfectly. I'm not sure why. I mean, that should also sort of some, but I don't know. Uh, I, it's kind of beyond my pay grade to know what sort of eats what, right, in that strange digital realm. So I had this sort of weird idea of sort of things eating each other and processes sort of battling sort of right below the, sort of the digital surface of things, right? uh, which is very, very interesting. And then uh, I noticed that it was a good thing when I did some of those social field cards in real time that social field gorge went up. Right? So those sort of seemingly dead simple things could be sort of further developed into actually exploring the whole what you do and how you participate can actually sort of be instantly fed back to the participants. I mean, I skip all the most of the other kind of detailed feedback. It just, it was very, very interesting to me, right? And I, I could sort of listen to you guys better because I didn't chat too much myself. So here's kind of somewhat of a ballpark question, right? To sort of to, for you, for your further anneal, annealment and bringing to, to Alice. Can we explore the intersect of immersive digital experience, participatory inquiries, collaborative unfolding storylines, narrative theory, therapy, mindfulness and awareness dimensions all combined, making a difference for wellness? I just was sort of process writing when I was listening to you guys. So you kind of, I actually did write it down so I can just put it somewhere in, in our Senus right River the chat right but basically just ask her right alice and the others kind of what do you think is this worth exploring it's usually better to just ask those people right and, and they will say something in return yeah that might be worth exploring and then we explore that and the italian thing i mean i don't have that much experience with the, with the italians but those i have 
you just talk with them and something interesting comes along and they suggest, hey, we should do this as a project. And then you say, yeah, good, great. Right? So it's, it just sort of happens, right? It's kind of a weird, chaotic way of doing project management, but it seems to work for them, right? So why not, right? Mm. Uh, so whenever I try to be Swedish with other people, it basically just ends up in tears. And it's just, I don't usually do that. I mean, the whole sort of, let's do the Ericsson props proper project management structure first, right? And then we need to allocate half a million Swedish krona to even begin the pilot projects. And then we come to the actually really interesting questions after we have bored everyone to death. It's kind of, uh, I don't, <laughs> if I was sort of go full Swedish on you guys, that's what we should do, right? It's just that people seem to be terribly bored and run away screaming in the other direction. So I, well, but there's an option to do that, right? But, but, Let's first get a couple of million Swedish krona before we do that, right? Possibly let's never do that if we can hold, at all avoid it. So, but basically just ask her, right? Is there a wellness dimension to this and is it worth exploring? And she might say yes or no or suggest something else, right? That's and good. in practice, it's usually in two or three days not immediately, but in, within two or three days when it sort of has percolated for a while in, in her. So she has gotten sort of a reasonable chance to actually think about these things and coming up in an idea too. So it's, um, yeah. That's good, John. We'll, we'll do that. Let's, let's get back to the, um, the, the gorgeous, the, the, the feedback loop that we build in now. I mean, that's the first time we actually use something like this. Um, there, there's a gorge on the um, card deck station um, that's very similar, but it's not on the main interface. So what was your impression of that? Um, and I, I saw, Fleming, you had some good responses there, feedback on it is, it, it can distract, you know, if, if you put them there and your eyes wander and you track these numbers and want to, you know, sort of influence them. It, it made me want to cheat a little bit. Like, uh, well, I read what the instructions were and then I started replying to more people than I otherwise would. Or, or I would just have written things. I naturally feel like writing things, but now I made it more replies than I otherwise would because that was one of the gauges. That's not necessarily bad, but uh, if people spend too much attention on trying to influence the gauges, that's maybe not that great. That, uh, that's, that's a great point in itself, I mean, because one of the intentions I have on the interface is to make people reply to other people, you know, so the reciprocity goes up. But it's hard to do because you really have to pay attention to the interface or you have to make it so obvious that uh, it becomes almost disturbing, you know, a big button or whatever it is. Say, hey, reply instead of just write out your things. Um, but if, if that works in connection with looking at uh, one of the metrics and say, hey, actually something happened here, this would be... I think a good thing, right? So otherwise you would never think about it, right? You would just continue doing your thing and just typing and typing without reflecting for a moment and saying, hey, actually let me try to fold in and, and connect these, these points and respond directly to the participants. It, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. I mean, it could be if there was a, a measure for how many hidden artifacts have you found and it's at zero, you obviously will start looking for some hidden artifacts <laughs> and, and maybe mm. you should. Yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah, as long as it's a useful thing, as long as we make people do something that they really ought to be doing, uh, then mm. it's maybe good. I mean, optimally, eventually, if people want to gain things, or as you, you said, Fleming, you want to sort of cheat and you see, see what happens, which is a great gaming approach. Um, if we can somehow align that or nudge that along, so eventually the group finds itself participating in as a group and possibly as a slightly more aligned group and slightly more, I mean, slightly more enjoying the experience. And then we just need to, I mean, I just was thinking out loud here for kind of, let's say if some one or a combination of the gorgeous makes our own chat uh, become bigger. That could be really fun because if I sort of chat more, my chat bubbles grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually if I'm clever, I'm usually not that clever because I talk too much, right? But eventually I would figure out that, hey, I should talk less and then it sort of grows 
it kind of diminishes to kind of slightly more normal size. I mean, you could have real fun with this, right? Eventually, I see nothing but my own chat bubble, and it sort of <laughs> obscures the way everything else. Then I should realize that that's probably a bit too big, right? And and if I don't say anything, it sort of shrinks to sort of a font size two points, which is kind of barely legible, <laughs> no matter how you do magnify it. So it's kind of you should probably say something, right? So it's that could be really great fun, but I I don't know if whether people would game that or not, right? But it it could work with some additional affordances as a social proxy, right? As a presence proxy, which would be great, right? Because then we have, I mean, the whole half of that Gagioli book is about presence and social presence in digital and active environments. So it, 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 might, it might actually be worth it, right? To have people Ah, oh, well, that's a whole other kettle of fish, right? If people are so, if something wrong with them, basically, they're not well. I mean, people would let the combinations sort of let loose on this could sort of spell utter disaster, right? So the design needs to take into account who are participating, which is, well, I haven't really even begun to think about that. But anyway, as, as, a, as a kind of a, as a combining... Yeah. The experience of the user interface, user interface, the user experience, and the gorgeous, right? So they kind of it it makes sense to 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 get play and game and participate and do things, right? You press switches or buttons or not, right? Yeah, that's right, John. And there's one thing you brought up that's very interesting. Um, there is a a collective metric, and that's what these gorgeous are right now. They're looking at us as a group right so it's it's our density we created it's our you know throughput you know how many how many messages are we collectively putting out there right and 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 the other one um but but the individual i omitted that because um i don't want to point out you know individuals participation levels right that's i don't think it's a good thing it's 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 good if you have a Something like what you just mentioned, John, it's, it's funny to have it as, you know, reflected in, in what you see on your screen, basically, right? Um, so it gives you a hint to say, hey, I'm missing an action or I'm doing too much, and then I can reduce that without, if, if you can do it on your screen only, right? So, so it's, it doesn't, you know, be, it's not visible for everybody else. So we don't want to mm. see you out there, right? Um, that's a good thing, but but the the focus here. This is what what is so new here is it's a collective metric, so so you have to understand it from we all trying to get to, uh, into the green area of that gorge, right? So it's a good thing if this happens. Um, without and th this was the other good feedback, John. Without becoming like a um, a lab rat here. Right, so this is on an experiment, and we're part of it, and you know we I'm being measured now, basically, right, oh my goodness, I better behave um we don't want to get in that direction either, but it it needs to be perceived as a feedback mechanism that that increases the whole you know group coherence group creativity thing right that that's the 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 value it can provide to to the expedition but it's obviously it's it's really difficult to convey that right because the moment you see a goat it's like something someone is being measured here right oh my goodness what 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 is this right so we have to be a bit careful here how we position and display this all this stuff right I, well, like there's also the possibility of having completely sort of uh, non ag gauges what like the point is having some kind of feedback and it could be something more sort of organic that's something a color changes or something is a little different about the environment so that we get feedback but it's not like it doesn't force us into trying to move this uh, that needle on the dial but 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 we we notice it it becomes part of the periphery somehow yeah i like that very much the whole lim liminal thing uh, that's i mean obviously also the the color thing and and the sound i was sort of just writing here that it might actually be that we have been doing it mostly okay all the time so there's individual chat responses there's lots of things already in design that sort of is there conducive to a collective experience experience i mean 
everyone is looking at basically episode one and two and three and the vortex and the time and, and what right? so we might want to look at if some stuff is individual already in the chat our individual chat responses right which then we can do however we want that works for our service and then the collective experience is also fine and then the it, in between individual and collective, there's a very, very interesting possible intersect overlap. Sort of in between me space and we space. And what's that, right? Something participatory, something collaborative, something interactional, something, right? Group or team or, or well. Uh, but it's, 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 it can't be too emphasized. I do like your idea, Joachim, with having possibly further on, if the technology allows for it, uh, that some participants have part of the experience being individual, but most most of it is us. Most of it is the collective knowledge expedition. Uh, I mean, I could draw a card myself, and that says something to me, kind of left-hand column, right-hand column, and then, then I can say something clever or not. Uh, and others can have their own way of sort of ongoing kind of breadcrumbs uh, roped path through because it's, there's different ways to, to interact. I possibly interact in my way and others do it in, in a slightly different way. Right? Uh, and if the environment can accommodate that, that's a good environment. I mean, Facebook already did, right? And they did it well enough, so there's 1.8 billion participants. So they obviously did something right, right? With Before individual profiles and then the whole big uh, monster, the collective thing that is Facebook. I want to reinforce something you've said a couple times now, John. Before I forget again, it's about the environment um, relating to individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the gauges on the screen. And I, it does, and you, I think that's right, Joaquin, that you don't necessarily want your individual stats just sticking out there. It's kind of embarrassing and maybe in some situations, but anyway, so that I guess it doesn't necessarily belong there. But uh, for one thing, the Milan team, or, or maybe it's some of their associates, they do extensive profiling with participants before they do their experiment or their studies or mm -hmm. session. Uh, and they, you know, there's a lot of human interaction, I imagine. And, uh, and I do that too. That's how I work with students and how I've been doing it for about, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. I, I fell into this way of doing it. I just, get as close as I can to the, the person I meet and try to put myself in that person's place. And, uh, and you know, whatever I figure out after that, I figure out in some of the experiments that we did here, I did use simple, very open-ended questionnaires as part of that, but I don't always do it. It's just usually a personal getting to know the person. So there's some version that something like that should probably happen with, so that the environment is somehow respond to it sounds like there's a lot of human intervention here and, and on the, maybe yeah. the team has to do a lot of that maybe yeah. some more of it can be automated later but i don't know let's let's I I lose the thought but that's your yeah no, I mean, the, 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 those, somehow, those, those yeah. are great points Ron. really great points yeah yeah i hope that's just reinforcing what you said yeah and let's let's do one more thing ron because you mentioned an interesting thing here which is surveys uh, that's very interesting very important for the Milan team too. Um, before we get into the survey thing, to sort of profile and find out more about the people. Um, sorry? Did you say surveying? Surveys, okay. surveys. A survey, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah survey, survey. Um, I just want to go back one more thing about the, uh, the, the gorgeous. Um, actually, we do have one that's individual and we haven't used that yet. Um, this is for the diving experience. And the diving experience has, a, has an oxygen gauge that tells you how much oxygen is left in your tank. And that's your oxygen. So there's, there's actually a survey up front that asks you, that. That, that ask you, are you a good diver or not, right? 
um, <laughs> or, or a breathing exercise, and then are you good at this? And that determines how fast your oxygen runs out. So this is an interesting metric to me because this shows your oxygen level, right? Um, and uh, depending how far, how fast you run out, you need to interact with the others, you know? Um, that can be built into the story where you say, hey folks, I have to get back to the surface because I'm running out of oxygen, right? I don't know what's gonna happen next. <laughs> um, but that's an individual metric, right? So this is your oxygen level and uh, it's displayed on your screen and others don't see that, right? And then, but you do need to communicate that to the group. That's what makes it very interesting to me, right? So you get some feedback on some value that uh, you want to take action on, right? So, so you have to project your intention back to the group and say, hey, I'm doing fine or I'm not, you know? And then the group has to decide. That's the other interesting aspect. Now the group has to decide what to do with this information, right? So we know that someone's running out of oxygen. So end of expedition or send them up to the surface or whatever, right? Um, that's so really more, that's a really, it's very story oriented and it's, uh, it's not the same as the gauges that show data about how the network is functioning and so forth. It's more, it's in, just in the story. It's your yes. oxygen. It's not the same kind of embarrassment yeah. that you might feel <laughs> until it has stats projected out there. Yep, that's right. That's right. right. Uh, yeah. It so can be used, it can be used for the, for the average, average, Everest expedition too, right? So instead of uh, the, the tube. Actually, I have an idea there. We could do it in Everest. I mean, the, the four of us should go on Everest and soon, right? We haven't done that, the four of us, yep. which is a shame, really. Yep. Uh, and then we could have the oxygen thing. I mean, we do climb on our Everest with oxygen. I mean, sometimes we have climbed without oxygen because we, are, we have superpowers. But let's say we don't own all the superpowers. We actually need oxygen. And then... Uh, we could introduce some kind of small, minute variations, right? I mean, ideally, that would be amazing if we had actual sensors on ourselves, right? So if we feel anxious or, or <laughs> breathing too much or consume too much oxygen, there should be kind of an impromptu meditation tent, right? Complete with meditation exercises and so on. And then we could rig the gauges so someone is kind of breathing and getting half panicked because that sometimes happens when you climb up high up, right? Or it's a malfunction of the tube, or we could weave in lots of continuity in the story. And then when I get anxious, right? I get a panic attack, I sort of breathe, most of my oxygen is gone. I go to the meditation tent, and the levels of oxygen replenishes hmm. because we have a spare tube in the meditation tent. Yeah, that's a good thing to have, right? It's what you should have in a meditation tent. So meditation oh, yeah. exercises so, and a spare tube. And then I can sort of go rejoin you guys and my, my gauze is now okay. So everyone is breathing a sigh of relief, right? I mean, you hear, right? Breathing a sigh of relief, it kind of works, right? It's a metaphor for the expedition. So suddenly we're worrying and it, it, and it, it drama and it resolves. It, it's, it's a set of affordances and setups and continues as it works really well inside the story. So it's kind of, it's already aligned. Um, I mean, I, I actually would like to test that and see, uh, I mean, I do have techniques. I can put myself in a kind of anxious state, right? It's a superpower I have. I can worry. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm not sure how, if you, you guys worry, but I can now and then do that if I want to. So, but this would work much better with sensors. We could imagine it, right? And that would possibly work almost as good. But with sensors and com getting, offering this further on together with the Milan team, that could actually work wonders, right? Because now suddenly we have an environment, we, we do these things and make sure that everyone remains more or less healthy and, and whole, right? Throughout the journey. Yeah, and real sensors. Yeah. Real sensors like they're using, right? Real sensors like EEG and galvanic skin response and heart rate yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, the, ne the next yeah. step, which we can't prove yet, right? We need to test it. But if that meditation tent actually works, there's suddenly an imagined tent, an imagined tube has measurable benefit of heart rate and, and, and breathing and so on, right? Then, then, then that is an amazing service, right? Because now we can get people to breed better 
just by opening up a browser tab, which is pretty amazing. So, uh, but I mostly like it for, it brings us much more into the story and the flow of the story. It's nothing like, uh, and have, have a character and have something bad befall that character. It works all the time. Cool. Yeah, the, so, the heart rate thing and the variability, I think that's a simple, relatively simple sensor. Um, that can yep. be done, I think, with your, with your phone yep. um, that captured it in some fashion. There's, I'm sure there's an app for that. Not my phone, but in most cases, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so, so you input that, and that determines um, your level of oxygen depletion. That's that's a great connection there, right? And yeah. as, as you said, Ron, it's uh, it's tied so much into the story. So we have the physical and the the body experience, you know, tied into the uh, the virtual real experience. That's that's an excellent thing. Let's 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 dive into that further. Love it. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about. <coughs> is taking surveys. Um, and I know Alice had brought this up a couple of times. Um, and I looked into the, the research literature there. The way they determine, say, um, you know, elevated states of mind is they run a survey. And if you look at these scientific surveys, they are horrendous. They're like 50 questions, 100 questions, very granular, talking about you know, a certain situation and how do you respond to that. So after the fact, and you have to go through lists and lists of uh, you know, ranges of you know, deeply agree or, or disagree or deeply immersed or not immersed. Um, that kind of serving is what they do. What, what I feel we can bring here to the table is a better way of serving people. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, put it into the flow of the story. Um, instead of you jumping completely out of it, you know, make it part of the story itself. Um, a, a simple example is what, what we've done is uh, the poll survey. Um, and I've, I've put one there that's before you enter the Sagamatha Cafe. There's a survey now that says, what, what's your volume level? You want to have a loud, quiet, or medium, right? So that's a simple poll that just captures your preference, essentially, right? So it says, yes, give me a loud volume for all of these story points. And I'm storing that in the database, and then I'm using that for the rest of the expedition, right? But to me, this is a, a good enough in the flow stopgap to say, hey, let's capture some some emotion, some impression, you know, and then move on with the story. The the other one is um, here. Let me just share my screen here for a second. Is uh, the uh, the game table thing we use this time? Um, do, do you see that? Yes. Um, and particularly this two by two here that uh, we've used, um, where you have on one dimension the resonance with others and then here the immersion inside the story. That to me is just another form of a survey, right? It's, it's very visual versus, you know, text-based survey, but it's survey nevertheless. So you can use your avatar, move it around. Um, which, which what, what I like here is, is, again, this collective aspect. Because yesterday I started out with putting my avatar, oh, right over here, right? The next to John's, feel deeply immersed. But then, and then Fleming, you said something about, you know, how you were not so much involved and immersed. And it made me think, and that's, that's absolutely right, right? So I'm more here now because I've seen where the other avatars are positioned, right? So it's sort of, gives me a deeper reflection or stop, stopping moment where um, I think and adjust myself towards sort of the, what the group thinks currently, right? So that's the dimension. You don't have that in, in individual surveys, right? So if you give you a piece of paper and you fill out the thing, it's yours, it's your own, right? Whereas this, this year is really kind of a collective survey um, that reflects, it's transparent. You can see each other's responses immediately, right? It's real time, and uh, you can adjust your, your position after you see the others, right? So, so there's a sort of a coherence happening too. So just because you see where the others are moving, you double, you know, triple think, why did he or she do that, right? Why is, why is John in that quadrant? Well, I know why John is here. Um, 
but um, you know, I know, and I know why Ron is obviously here because all these glitches we had yesterday, right? Um, but uh, that that really made me think and 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 see this as a tool um, for maybe for the Milan team, but but also for the participants to say, hey, where am I um, in inside the story? Without being too dis disruptive, right? I'll, I'll stop here. I just want to hear what what you think about this as as a, as an input mechanism to capture data from the participants. Well, I think it, it's useful, as you say, that we interact with each other and respond off of what somebody else has done, which gives a more full picture. Uh, I, I generally have reservations about placing myself on a chart like this. It, it makes me sort of think in overdrive, like my my CPU goes into high load trying to figure out what's the right position. I, 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 it's not an easy thing for me to decide. I would like to give the right response, so I work on it, but it's not easy. It's not the kind of thing I can do sort of intuitively feeling my way. So for that reason, I, I have some dislike for being asked to do that, and particularly if there are more categories like your lovely chart with all the emotions. I have an even harder time figuring out how to Place myself so there yeah that's it's a great chart but if I have to figure out where I am uh, which is hard to do while I'm having an emotion and then I need to sort of <laughs> analyze it <laughs> with a, <laughs> a dozen different criteria at the same time that's really hard so that's that's generally speaking my problem with charts that ask me to sort of find the right position which is to me distinctly different from something where I can just sort of pick anyone and get something out of it like which is in part what i get from the card sessions if pulling a card and riffing off of that i don't need to do the right give the right answer or anything there's a little randomness and i can have some response to that whereas this kind of chart it kind of we asked for the right answer and so i'm just saying I'm, i have some misgivings about it even though i can see the use also yeah, no, I mean, these are excellent uh, feedback, uh, Fleming, and also for your further context, why it's so important. I think we spent, me, Joachim, Ron, and possibly also Henk back in the day, we spent up to six months focusing on how to sort of move back and forth in between an action and representation, in between actually experience the whole flow of things and just being there, and then scraping up some 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 valid points and deliverables and stuff right and possibly it can't be fully resolved which is an interesting design challenge right if it's if it, this would have been easy someone would have made the most wonderful perfect survey tool which i have never seen mm. But obviously, I'm also a bit similarly biased. I went through 15 years hating all kinds of service and policy with a passion and a vengeance. <laughs> and I went out of my way telling all people who used service how absolutely abysmally bad <laughs> it was, and they were for doing it, right? But that changed when I discovered uh, that two-by-twos can be seen as ridiculously simplified mandalas. And I do like mandalas for lots of reasons. But that still begs the question of what the hell does this two by two have to do with my multidimensional fully presencing experience? Possibly nothing. So, but here's just an idea, right? It could be awful and it could work. So uh, one of these two by twos or several could be just be made sort of introduced right before as a sort of preamble that at camp two there will be these things that we I mean so then it would work inside a story so we climb in between camps and in the camp we sort of do some kind of review some kind of assessment some kind of service polls debriefings popular postmortems something and I mean for Alice that wouldn't probably be a problem because she, she kind of likes possibly polls and service more than we do right and for, for kind of to meeting her halfway somehow, right? That could be, um, uh, I'm just careful not to, trying to cram too much into that poor camp experience, right? What I do know from experience we did that worked really well for all the participants, we were basically sitting around the campfire, 
listening to music and then we just said nighty night and then we sort of actually did that that worked and then we woke up next morning then we continued to climb opening up the tent flaps and just merry good day to to each other and just started climbing it and but that was a if correct me if i'm wrong ron joachim that was a six day thing we did right back in the days so we could use the flow or the diurnal flow as sort of wove that into the part of the that will it's a bit diff more difficult if we just do one or two hours right just to cram everything in there but um I mean, movies can cram in years and years into two hours, right? So it, it can be done. We just need to be clever about sort of how much of the boring stuff we, we cram into a decidedly more meaningful and more sort of immersive experience. It's, and I, I, I don't, don't really know how to, um, there's probably some good user experience, user interface design books that sort of addresses this. Jun Kolko has looked at this, I, I know, in mm. some parts mm. of his books, right? So we could go steal stuff from him, possibly. Yeah, but let me, let me, let me respond to that too, John. And what you just said, Fleming, um, to me, there, there are these two kinds of measurements. We can, you can measure directly or indirectly, right? So indirectly is you're rather looking at your behaviors, you know, your, your actions, um, like the cards, you respond to cards. Uh, how do you respond to the cards? Or well, the conversation itself is sort of an indirect measurement. Um, what do you say in the conversation? What can I extract from the mood, the emotion you, you display in your conversation? So all indirect measurements versus the direct measurements is really the stuff like this, the survey. How do you feel? Um, what's what's your current state of mind you know and and, and creating a short survey and and bio biofeedback is also a direct measurement i mean how direct can it get right if i measure your heart rate at the very moment now right and you share that in some fashion with with the group it can get more direct than that it's that's a direct measurement that even raises questions about you know privacy can i share this and you know is that too personal um but, but that's, I think, the spectrum here between, you know, the indirect measurements and then the direct measurements. I, I still do like to have some kind of a direct measurement in there because it's so simple, you know, because it, it shows you something. I think that's not so obvious in, in the indirect measurements, right? If I put my avatar right here, it, sh it tells everyone I'm really resonating with a few of you guys. Um, I'm really immersed in the story. I mean, it's direct, it's really obvious. Um, and I mean, I have, it also means the person has to be open enough to say, yes, I, I do want to share this versus I just put off my mask and, you know, I'm not telling you who I really think I am, right? Well, well, um, the trouble as, as an alternative view on it, I sort of consider that this very indirect, but it's a different way of looking at it. Like I'm all for direct measurements. I would happily be measured all over and have my heart share my heart rate or whatever with anything. Okay. But this here, for, for me to fill this in, I feel I need to sort of see myself from a distance and including seeing how I would see myself, seeing myself, seeing myself from a distance in order to figure out where am I. Mm. Okay. Which, which is quite different from that I honestly will look at what do I see right now? Like if you ask me for a word, how do I feel right now? I'll come up with something and I, that doesn't trip me up. But if I have to sort of measure myself on some scales, then I get into this sort of weird introverted trying to figure out the right answer which kind of throws me off. I'll happily give anything that comes to mind. I'll happily be measured, but I have trouble with sort of putting myself on scales and, and stuff like that because I'm not, I'm too busy having the experience in a sense to be able to see myself in the mirror to see, am I happy? Am I sad? I'm not sure. Do I look happy? Well, now I'm just trying to look at myself. So now I'm concentrated. Now I'm not what I was before. That's very confusing. Yeah, um, yeah. So that that's what throws me off. I mean, otherwise, I, I I would happy have a way happily have a way of measuring, and or saying things directly. Um, that's that's like most people yeah. probably feel that way. I I suspect most people do feel that way. I I sort of feel that way, but um, the, the, there was a in, 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 so back in the days. Yeah. So go on, go on. 
I found out that if I have to take a survey, and it's about deeply emotional stuff, uh, as that once happened when my daughter was hospitalized. The uh, psychologist had to fill out a questionnaire in the midst of all this. And uh, so I had to do it. And it was easy for me. It was all about all this emotional stuff. And I think the uh, psychologist said, uh, most people don't fill this out this quickly. And it's the same way with the uh, two by two here. I, it's just not a problem. If, but if I didn't have to do it, I probably wouldn't do it. Yeah. The, the, back in the day, the early ex knowledge expeditions, uh, we kind of intuitively just yeah. fluidly moved in between inactive selves, uh, real selves, whatever the hell that is, uh, imagined selves and and uh, we sort of semi-fictionalized ourselves we sort of were sometimes into character and all of that uh, was probably a key part in us dreaming up the whole knowledge competition thing out of thin cloth out of nothing and I, I've never been able to actually fully understand what the hell we did because it just happened so fluidly, so intuitively, right? But I do know that there was an amazing flow. So the flow was strong enough, the field was strong enough, so we attracted people. So we could go on jury rigged, goes to your idea, Fleming, about that sort of the simpler thing, right? Because we used to Google Plus and then some pictures, and, and it was strong enough to keep people in there for six days, right? Which is <laughs> pretty damn amazing. Uh, we were probably glowing in the night without knowing it, right? So uh, <laughs> there was something there, and it has to do with this sort of just moving in and out of, of an action representation, imagination, semi-fictionalization, staying in character, going out of character, reflecting on what the hell you're doing, and, and just moving in and between those. And you, you, you mentioned that, Fleming, that, that that was a kind of a, it's obviously confusing, right? Once you try to understand all of this with, with minute detail, it's possibly impossible. But we did it, right? Uh, so if we can begin to possibly worry less about the service and worry a bit more about um, testing lots of small things, like your Eye of Horus and, and whatever, what I'm kind of on a mad tangent with my cards and on, on that, right? And eventually we see that, hey, this little piece over here could go well with that little piece over there. And, and, and we, sh we start to sort of move. Um, I do know, right, that, that fluid thing. Sometimes Ron is Ron. And sometimes Ron is a fictional character who comes equipped with his completely imagined dog, Rohan. And I, Ron just brought Rohan along, which is not a real dog, but inside knowledge expedition, that dog is as real as any other real dog, right? So we, we just, yeah, of well, course, George, right? Joachim brought him along, actually. Or Joachim uh, yeah. started Rohan. I'm kind of wondering where Rohan is these days. Right? I think you're not <laughs> What? <laughs> <laughs> He's somewhere. A, a stray virtual um, real dog. Just for some reason... Uh, the uh, must have been a couple of weeks ago. It doesn't happen that often, but there's this spot I walked by on the way to the grocery store from the studio. And uh, I, when we were going through that, I used to just have this feeling that Rohan was accompanying me along the this part of the trip. And uh, I just had that feeling again a few weeks ago. I just remembered, oh yeah, there's Rohan still, yeah, yeah, still walking along with me. It doesn't happen constantly, but it's still there. How oh, interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let's bring him back one day. The Everest story. Well, I mean, I kind of he's, he's living, he's living, you know, near he, he's, he's basically just waiting for us to <laughs> get, right. get off our butts and go on the, the, the Sagamata trek. Right. And there he is. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I mean, this also brings oh, lots of emphasis on the health and wellness, mental health and wellness thing that, that the Milan team are exploring, right? Because if Ron can do that and still appear perfectly sane in an, inside a knowledge expedition, if I would go around with my wife here, no coping, and suddenly I would bring along my imagined dog, right? The, the, I mean, this is Sweden we're talking about, right? I would probably <laughs> be at risk of being committed. So, <laughs> but 
imagine now a place we're kind of barking up possibly up the wrong tree here right possibly where uh, have you seen the kind of one flew of the cuckoo's nest right mm -hmm. where all the all, all the mental patients escapes and suddenly uh, jack kind of turns them all into doctors and they go on a tour on a boat and suddenly they basically appear normal right because he has told them that now you're doctors you have lab coats on right well. And we could offer an environment where all those possibly slightly weird or more weird, I'm not sure who they are kind of looking at as, as a target group, the Milan team, right? And suddenly everything just they do sort of makes sense in that particular environment. It's not frowned upon. And then if we would pull off that, we would have such a hugely valuable service, right? Suddenly you can go somewhere you dive just right in your, into your laptop, into your browser, and suddenly you're slightly less crazy. Just if that would just be for an hour, right? A short respite in between bouts of sort of being seen as absolute bonkers by the rest of the society. But here, you get you get the breather, right? I hope that the uh, Milan team is uh, in tune. I suspect they would be with what you know. Uh, I would. I would hope that the best uh, psychotherapist would goes with the person they're helping and yeah. they don't, they don't really kill them. And, and uh, they, the best ones actually understand what's going on to quite an extent. And you know what I mean? It's what you said, John, I forget how you put it a minute ago. Yeah. About how it doesn't, you're not just, it's a place uh, of freedom for the so-called patient and, uh, yeah. The therapist doesn't judge that. Exactly. I mean, uh, and if we then can add some sensors on that, right? So we have solid evidence that after a sort of repeated one hour session for a couple of weeks, there's noticeable improvement in Tom, Dick and Harry, right? I mean, that, then we're just off to the races. Now, one early objection I had, because we talked about this kind of a couple of years ago as well for your information uh, Fleming and I was sort of a bit reserved right because then we would be sort of the lab code guys right uh, and they would be mostly very interesting cl clientele right customers <laughs> but it, it, it's at least an option right and we do know narrative theory narrative therapy sorry um, storytelling having a journal sound imagination, all those have healing modalities to them, right? So, um, I mean, why not, right? It's, but I, I'm kind of looking at kind of the whole experience, right? I've always personally seen this as we are, we are two healthy people as Sherpas, what healthy people are do, less healthy people. There's probably, I've, I've always seen that way. I mean, I've never just even judged that that's how I see it. Kind of, we are sort of super healthy, right? Because we can extend ourselves into doing seemingly crazy things and it's, it's just natural, right? It's just nothing to it. Um, but right. that's more difficult to sell, right? Because we invariably fall into the coaching sinkhole, right? Never to appear again. So. That is one thing I really would like us to stay away from. But anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, one more thing about the, uh, the the charts here, because I do think we want to present some innovative ways of capturing some of the data they might uh, use for their purpose. I like your notion of testing, 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 John. Um, so we can use this and you know have a lot of variations on this. You know, as you can see, already three different ways of uh, playing this. And then see how people respond to that, right? I think that's that's the goal here. If they reject it, if they feel estranged, um, if they're thrown off, as you say, Fleming, right? If they're completely thrown off out of the story, not a good thing. Then we need to fine tune this. Um, but if, pardon, if on the other pardon, side, sorry, pardon, yeah, pardon, I'm sorry, but uh, whatever the way, or whatever the chart or other method, uh, I, it seems like we do have a unique opportunity to look at things on the fly. So there must be some way to make that work. 
hurt or make it help useful to other people, such as the Milan team. Yeah, totally. So, okay. Yeah, just, let's ex let's experiment. This way doesn't work. Some nothing. That's right. Pardon. That's right. So I, I think we do have that opportunity. And also, you did mention that we have the conversation itself, and that's and we have a transcript, and we know what the whole everything that happened. So that's an un usual environment to be able to explore for whoever wants to ex study it right John. right right Ron. and you know the thing with with us we're already familiar with these collaborative you know team tools like like google sheets or the the google drawing thing here um they they are usually not right because that's fairly new and it's it's unknown to them really to say they can in real time, manipulate what they see oh, yeah. on the screen, and people see, that. see that. Yeah. No, that. That's a cool thing. What and and here's one thing: we can even level up on this chart here, um, and uh, that may be a bit out of the comfort zone of a few people, because not only can you position your own avatar here, right, and say, you know, I'm here, I'm here. In a second round, you can say, okay, now look at the other avatars and you move them around according to what your impression was of what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've listened to during the expedition so far. So I can see that maybe John was really deeply immersed in the story because of how he responded, how he enacted it, right? So I moved John a little bit over here to the, to the upright. So suddenly this becomes a collective tool where not only you share your own impression, but it's the group now responds to um, everybody else. It's a that's, bit. That's, poten that's potentially easier. For me, that would actually be easier to yeah. move the rest of you than to do myself. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And, and, and there's some brilliant services and some real solid research lines of inquiry that can be combined here. That's, that's brilliant. Really, really good. Uh, I, I think that's kind of worth to emphasize that idea because suddenly you have... Uh, all those things coming together into a thing you can actually do. You can take other avatars and move them about, right? So it brings in mirror neurons, it brings in social presence, it actually brings in presencing. Uh, you begin to actually care about those small thingies on the screen um, and you negotiate things, right? The whole discourse on the fly. So th this is quite amazing, but we probably need to go reread. I mean, I do know for a fact that I'm not sure if it was Deleuze or Foucault or Guattari, some of those foggy French guys that said that we probably have a chatty self and an active self, a semi-fictional self. Sometimes we are in character, far and few between. Uh, I mean, the really crazy people who who are on meds or put away, right? They try really hard, but they can't ever go fully into character in a way that works for the rest of the society. So they're put on meds or straight jackets or whatever we do to them, right? And the rest of us, we can, we can fake it possibly, right? So we, we can sort of enjoy the benefit of not having straight jackets on, right? So there's very small differences, at least if you go with Foucault, which is interesting because we have sort of built in kind of an anti-panopticon, right? where we can actually sort of explore one, one additional degree of freedom. I mean, in the panopticon, you can actually have, enjoy one degree of freedom less than normal life, right? Because you know that big brother or the warden or someone is, is watching you, right? So, um, I mean, Facebook is a panopticon, right? And we, we can sort of still endure that more or less, right? But we know that sort of the big data, Mark Zuckerberg is watching somehow, right? And he steals half of our data while he's at it, right? So it's, these things are, sort of real, right? There's 1.8 1. 8, 1. 8 billion guinea pigs running around inside his sort of little field of minions, and he is kind of the despicable him, right? So uh, there's almost everything to be tested here in down to those small things. That's why I like that idea so much, because this is a very simple thing, can be implemented, it makes sense, it's perfectly doable for everyone with a very little learning curve. Now, we obviously need to sort of figure out, uh, should, it, should it even be a two by two? Should it be some other spectrum? And kind of Fleming had a brilliant idea of sort of the colors, right? So it's kind of more fluid. Uh, I actually do have a sort of cross hybrid in between colors and, and two by two. So it has everything to do with emotions. So I will share that later. 
and suddenly you would begin to actually care about only moving the other avatars when it really feels important to do so because it, it's that's such an affordance of, of the movement and, and the board right mm. and and hopefully if we go at it for a while and test it ourselves we would have to feel viscerally that we are kind of moving each other so we are more or less converging in some place and that feels pretty sinuous right that feels pretty damn good kind of the flow right the, the group flow and then we're kind of back to square one with one of the big reasons why we read that network flow group creativity and why I started on my mad quest for the group creativity cards in the first place, right? Just to see, can we actually get there? Which for me would be very, very closely adjacent to Fleming's quadrant, right? The magic quadrant. Mm. We would actually sort of enact magic right there with these digital things which is me kind of trying to connect possibly too many dots. But I, I, I would at least share that emotion, uh, colory, almost two by two thingy later on. So you will see what, I, what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah. Listen, I, I need to go soon, but I, I just wanted to mention one example of the indirect thing. There was some uh, a network data center which had like thousands of servers and they wanted to give people an, an indication of whether the network was really busy. There was a lot of traffic and and they wanted something subtle and they ended up with like having a fan in the ceiling that had a, like a paper strip hanging on it and that the speed of that fan was controlled by an overall measure of, of how the data center was doing in terms of throughput or something. So people could just look up and see that the paper strip was, was really like flapping in the wind. There's really stuff going on. If it was just hanging there, there's not much going on. And it's, it's somehow they liked that better than having a gauge that said, now we're putting uh, five terabits per second through. It, it worked better to have an indirect thing where everybody knew how how the data center is doing. So sort of a physical, organic, indirect kind of thing. Um, so it could be a little something changes, like the the steam is uh, is racing a little faster in the, in the spa or something like that, if, uh, <laughs> if something. Yeah, there, there's a whole category of things. It's called ambient devices. Um, and there are some vendors out there where you can buy one thing that's called an ambient orb. That's a glowing stone you put on your table yes. and you can connect that to your stock market portfolio, for example, right? Exactly, exactly. Glows yeah. bright red, you know, something's going on there. So yeah, that's, that's an option. We should explore that. What I did right now is um, I put the gorges more into the background. Um, you hardly see them, but if you hover over them, um, then they come back to the foreground and you can see the exact data that's coming out of this. So, so this puts it a little bit, you know, you know don't look at this all the time, but uh, if you want to, you can drill down on the data, um, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, let's keep that ambient device thing in, in mind. I like that too, um, to create some kind of a different level of feedback, um, indirect level of feedback. Cool. I mean, the, the feedback is the thing, right? I mean, I don't want to torment you with the whole Gordon Pask thing. But if you want to later on, Gordon Pask has sort of spent three decades on figuring out what's the dealio with, with feedback loops and conversations. And the good thing with Gordon Pask is he sees conversations between two people or more people or between a person and a machine or something else completely. Right? So it's really useful all the bit abstract stuff if we want to sort of see if we have these number of devices inside and and, and affordances and artifacts and stuff and surveys and whatnot um uh, does this lend for good solid feedback right and is that feedback helping us move along our chosen trajectory and, i mean if not we could have perfect affordances and then nudges it in the slightly wrong direction, which then we need to tweak stuff, right? And we could have very crude, again, Fleming's brilliant thing with sort of the duct tape two, two by four expedition. But the crude, simple affordances are nudging us along in a really great direction. And then that's arguably better because we can always polish up and add production values and so on, right? That's obviously complicated, but it's not complex. But if we have something that works, which is why I've always advocated for 
and I said that a million times Ron, Ron and, 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 and Joachim, we have something that it's really weird, but it seems to work somehow. So let's see if we can keep that. And then we can also tweak lots of things, but if we end up tweaking it, so it basically just is, okay, now it's perfect production values, but it's dead, right? That's, well, still will be great production values, but it's kind of would be rank 2.3 in the IMDB scale. So it's kind of not good, right? So um, I, I, I would rather have an indie film kind of making kind of a runaway hit, right? Than having a something posh that no one wants dares twiddle with because it's, it's too nice, right? But that's just me, kind of that's my bias. I do hope we could keep as the touchstone of the, the meaning of the original experience. I'll, I mean, you can never go back, but and still, yeah. it has some meaning. And uh, I think I that does remind me that I wanted to mention that it's, the experience it just seems to have told me over and over again that uh, it's best to keep tweaks about six weeks behind, at least six weeks behind. So when the tweaks come on board and they seem to work then you just try keep them individually, uh, maybe mess with them once or twice or three times a week and collectively maybe once a week, whatever it is. And you're just making sure it still works and uh, in six weeks, so the tweaks are always running at least six weeks behind the event, at least especially if it's a significant event, a performance, a meeting, a test, something like that. And, and as it approaches, the, the closer the event approaches, the less do less. Yeah, yeah, less. yeah, and yeah, th yeah. And three days before the event, do nothing. Walk away from it. Exactly. I mean, I'm sorry obviously, I, it worked for me. And yeah, I, I, I feel it's important to, to mention to, to Joachim, right? Again, kudos yeah. for your amazing work with the code. So this is not against production value, right? So obviously, we should do both. And if we manage to pull off both, yep. uh, stick with a dead simple story and add amazing production value, then we almost sort of go the Christopher Nolan strategy, right? Because Christopher Nolan was dead set on, this is a love story in between father and daughter, right? That's it. And then he added a couple of gazillion dollars and made amazing production values and built whole sets and he ended up with Interstellar, which is actually not all that bad, right? But for me, the key was that he stayed adamant on the sacredness of that very, very simple story. He's, it, it stays simple, the whole story. And Matthew McConaughey was interviewed and he said what flawed him as an actor was that he discovered viscerally in himself the more the story proceeded, the more intimate it became. So that flawed him and brought out the best in him. And we can actually see that in the movie. I mean, obviously, some people hate Matthew McConaughey. But I, I have to rather like him. So it's kind of that's but that dimension is just taste, right? That's sort of objectively, it's a good movie. Right? So not saying we have to do the whole interstellar thing, but it's those are two good principles to keep in mind, right? So, so stick with the story. Trust the unfolding storyline is a mantra of ours, or has been. And then we add stuff, exactly as you said, Rob. <laughs> and then it just works, right? Um, yeah, so we have a connection to the guy who created the uh, spaceships for Interstellar. So that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Guys, I need, I need to go. So I'll, uh, I'll have to catch you later. Thank you, Fleming. Thanks, Fleming. Good, See good you time. around. So good ideas. Your game is, your game is host, so I can leave. So, okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Ciao. Uh, ciao, ciao. Uh, should we just do a, what's it called? Checkout? Checkout, yeah, let's do checkout. Yeah, I could just say a word or two. I, sorry, I didn't say that when, when, when Fleming was around, but he, he'll get there eventually. The whole, um, what did I call it? Card session number three, sending as a service, enactment support systems. Actually, some of the things we talked about today in this Hangout,
could work really, really well as sort of an annotations and comments on that card session, right? So if we can just remember what we actually did say, it's basically just column F and you should scroll down a bit, right? Or, or the columns that says are the comments. And you scroll down a bit and there it is, the 11 or 12 cards. And I could give you a bit of a in on, I drew 11 cards at random because I wanted to have sort of maximum divergence as, and as large as a, a, a possibility space, contingency space as possible. So those are basically 11 contingencies, all those cards, because they are drawn at random. And then I added deliberately the 12th card as if it would be kind of like magic. All those 11 would land in a carefully chosen, deliberate, completely convergent card, something I just said, I wanted to land in an action and an activity. Thank you, right? I said to the universe. <laughs> you always say thank you, kind of, now and then to the universe, right? Uh, so you don't get more curveballs than you need to. But basically, this tells us that the cards that came up, uh, it's basically just me as a single player trying to sort of bump into things and go as far as possible inside this virtual real realm, right? And see if it's sort of a elastic, tensegral, bouncy boundary at the far edges. Right? And it is because I came up with those cards and just makes sense, right? So it's very, very difficult to break this thing, bordering on impossible, which is a good thing, right? Because then we know that if we query the virtual real realm somehow, inactively, by chat, by affordances, by indirectly, directly, by augmented by senses, whatnot, right? It's there, right? The, the, the field is there. Uh, what we need to do in response to Alice or others, whether it's research or service development or whatnot, uh, so the research line of inquiry we're pursuing with, with Alice is kind of testing the validity of the enactment support system itself. Is there something solid to what we're doing and, and walking and moving and climbing, or are we just full of shit, which is <laughs> possibly an important dimension, right? But um, does it pay? Well, then the optimal goals would then not be research and validity itself, but it would be kind of optimizing for experience. So it's a different gauge, right? It's a different metric. So then, but we still would, we would be well served by Alice saying, yeah, as an enactment support system, this works provided that A, B, C, D, E, and F, or whatever she says to us in our ongoing dialogue, right? So then we would have that. Then we say that for most of our paying participants, if we optimize criterion E and F, they're happy as clams and we could worry, we hide away all the other stuff inside somewhere, right? Make it part of an ambient scenery or episodes or something. It's, it's just there, right? It's there for those who can use it. Yeah, and um, exactly, and that's a, a, a key thing. I've asked my kids, right? Who just said, Dad, this is just great as it is. Just make sure there's stuff that we can mod so we can sort of tweak it so it works for us. Which is a huge order, right? It's, I mean, we still need to possibly a bit do kind of the model T Ford, right? You could choose any which kind of knowledge expedition you want as long as you choose black, right? Because <laughs> we, we only have that. We don't have more, we don't have completely different things. We have the knowledge expedition, right? So it's kind of model T for you. So, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> wow. in, inside that thing, right? It's, we can provide uniquely tailored driving experiences, right? So it's not just that it's just shut up and watch the damn episodes kind of thing. Right? We, we can actually, there's a million different options inside this constrained thing. And the constrained thing is sort of part of the magic because 
Um, yeah. I mean, not to put a fine, too fine point on it, but my 11 cards, which were drawn completely random, still made sense, which shows me that th this, is, this is magic, right? It shouldn't work, and it still worked, right? So those 11 first cards are magical. And what is even more amazing is that I could posit a deliberate chosen card, card number 12. And I'm already seeing that, hey, this magic goes places, right? So I'm querying and this field responds very intelligently to my query. Because the source input is just random atmospheric noise, right? So this tells us something quite profound. And if we won't, don't want to go to all the whole stratosphere, but just sort of keep ourselves with sort of the environment, the milieu, right? As the French say, right? That tells us that the whole semiotician thing with the Eigenwelt, Mitfeld, Umwelt thing actually makes perfect sense. So we have kind of an, um, an Umwelt machine, right? Which is just that simple fact by itself is worth, it's invaluable, right? But we also have talked about today mostly about, I mean, the Eigenwelt is tricky, right? Because everyone is different. I mean, the individual chat responses, right? And I, for a glitch, I couldn't actually chat, which was interesting. Um, we should probably look at the smallest necessary set of participatory affordances that connects individual with collective. So the individual things you can do, you can mod going with the feedback from my kids with the collective ambience experience of it all. Because then people will figure out a way to sort of weave these things back and forth together. And that is what will make sense to the participants. So it's, but still, there's lots of re that remains to be done, right? Uh, I can't guarantee that there has to be just a few affordances. We could end up with 100 affordances to do this smorgasbord participatory thing. Uh, that I don't know. Or we could just start with three and then inch our way towards more. There's so many different approaches. Yeah. I mean, Ron, you, you, you know that you can do anything from the Bach cantata to the jazz improv and anything in between, right? The bar can tell you have hundreds and hundreds of sort of constraints and it's very structured and very ordered. The yes, improv is the complete opposite almost, right? It may be, yeah. Uh... Yeah. And Alice is kind of more the bar cantata than the yes, improv, right? She has to be because she's an academician, right? But some of our clients might be more of the yes, improv guys. Well, then we need to do that. Mm -hmm. So possibly, this is an old idea of yours, Joachim, I think, where we could explore, uh, which we are kind of doing, uh, the, uh, the Yasuragi thing is kind of more just virtue, very still. Mm. And there's much less contingencies, and it, there shouldn't be contingencies. It should be just nice, right? Mount Everest is kind of at the other end. You need to sort of think on your feet, right? Yeah. Which means that Alice might love the Yasurai thing if she does that a couple of times more. She might not like the Mount Everest thing. Or I'm, I'm just completely wrong. I don't, possibly, I don't know. She might love the Mount Everest thing as well, right? From a pure academic, academic interest. Right? But bringing bringing people with, with mental health issues and then suddenly having them fall down the Kumbhai's fall might not be all that a great idea, right? Bringing them to Yasuragi and just having them relax for a while and sort of being, feeling for at least an hour that they are not completely crazy, that might be the ticket. So we might end up having a way to sort of simplify into services rather than necessarily adding lots of bells and whistles. Yeah, yeah. That's so John, this is this is what I intend to do with with your new card deck, right? Um, the group creativity deck. I want to bring this into the experience into the expedition, right? Yeah. Into the expedition space. Um, 
I like the way you explore that now with the spreadsheet, but uh, if we can make it part of the expedition, and that's another way of using cards, right? Right now we're just using them as a reflection point, as a, as a milestone, as a marker, right? Along the way up for the social field deck. But I'd like to use that as a, maybe it, maybe it can be as simple as, uh, well, here's a, here's a, here's a break point. Um, let's all get together for a card session. And then we, we run the session. By simply yeah. Drawing. Now, I mean, I didn't add it into story because I didn't know how to add it into a story, but, uh, the the group creativity uh, should at least in theory work really well in the Mount Everest thing <coughs> because in the Mount Everest thing is kind of an at least an imagined uh, matter of life and death. The team needs to stay put, stay sufficiently coherent. Otherwise, someone will just fall down and die, right? Or, I mean, you can't have enmities. I mean, you can sort of hate each other, kind of a bit, right? Because someone is snoring or someone smells terrible after three weeks on Mount Everest and whatever, right? But you can't sort of actively kind of criminally sort of hate someone and wanting them to do bodily harm, right? Because that then the expedition doesn't really work. So this lends itself beautiful for an enacted environment that actually requires group creativity because there's contingencies. But we need this, I mean, I had this crazy idea yesterday that possibly Alan Watts should come along on the Mount Everest tour, right? And he gives us the cards randomly. And then we don't sort of have the survey thing or the kind of feeling that this is something else. It's just, this is Alan Watts, right? Because he does crazy things. He's kind of a bit of a trickster, right? He wants to test us. <laughs> And now we need to be clever because it's bloody Alan Watts, right? So we need to, to respond something to it, right? Now, the idea with that is that then we would have a very crude AI already with the cards and, and, and Alan Watts. We just imagine an AI. And if we imagine it, it works. And then Alan Watts would then be sort of the survey affordance. So instead of doing the boring survey, so to speak, right? We're doing a chat with Alan Watts. And then ongoingly, if we add sensors, still works as Alan Watts as a kind of a stooge, the proxy for that. Or if we do kind of an ongoing session and we return to the captured recorded session and we want to reflect, there's another, also another idea we can have, right? So let's worry less of trying to sort of reflect midstream because I tested that. That's really hard to do, to stay in character and stay in third person at the same time and reflect on what you do. It's, it's really, really hard on the mind. Right? Yeah. So better to just stay in the story, stick with the knowledge expedition, stick with the unfolding storyline. If you want to sort of reflect and add bells and whistles, we can always do that as an additional service and then sort of replay it once it's captured. And then we can sort of move back and forth in between looking at what we did, right? Yeah. In a very similar way to what we are doing now with kind of the after action review, right? Because we still remember we did knowledge expedition, now we are here and we can sort of reflect back, right? I mean, sense making almost always works much better in, in sort of retrospect because we have experience, we have the data. But the Alan Watts thing would also help personalize the, the experience, right? It, it sort of, everyone would sort of be, be a bit like Rohan, but Alan Watts, right? So it's kind of, it's, it's easy to accept this imagined character, right? Because we've got a name on him, right? And he's doing things. So the moment we interact, if we just imagine that this Alan Watts serving us the cards, we are in effect extending ourselves into the virtual real environment because we sort of buy into the environment, the card, Alan Watts, so what I'm after here is kind of that fluidity we had in the beginning, because now we're kind of moving back and forth in between real selves, imagined selves, card playing selves, social selves, chatty selves, extending into virtual reality together with Alan Watts and enacting him as a character. So you kind of see that it's kind of all there in the just big confusing model, right? But the experience would be not at all confusing. It would just be us climbing and chatting amongst ourselves and occasionally chatting with Alan, right? So Alan would also be uh, 
we can sort of more conveniently focusing on just climbing and chatting. And then Alan Watts can come in and do the cards thing. I'm not sure if you meant, experienced that, Ron, but I experienced that weird displacement kind of thing, right? When I wanted to stay in the chat, and the last time I couldn't, and then I drew a couple of cards. And when I drew a couple of cards, that gave me sort of perspective on what happened. So I was moving back and forth in between different parts of myself, which is obviously kind of amazing, but for new participants, that is really, really hard, right? So um doesn't have to be Ellen Watts, right? It, it just kind of, I just couldn't see Richard Feynman drawing cards, right? I could see Ellen Watts drawing cards. Right. Richard Feynman would, 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 would give us uh, diagrams and, and things like that, right? <laughs> and, and, and really challenging questions. That would be perfect. So Richard Feynman could, could, couldn't mean to do that because it would be in character, right? Yeah, yep. he, show, he showed up yesterday in, in Ron's uh, debugging session. So we had Ron and me and yeah, um, yeah. doing the debugging yesterday. It was fun. It's good, John. And it's, it's, it's it, the, the challenge is the interaction model, you know, because uh, obviously we don't have an AI right now. So somebody has to take Yeah, but that's the thing, right? I mean, I'm not sure if you know, but I drew the cards randomly and they work, which means that it is an AI. It's, it's a finite set that works, performs double duty as an AI. You haven't just played it enough, so you're just going to use the dawn. I mean, if you play a couple of card sessions, you will see that, hey, isn't it weird that I can draw cards at random and it still makes sense? I mean, the old way of, right. of referring to AI was of calling it magic because it was beyond our normal ken. But it, it's a finite set, so it's it's really not me doing something funky, right? It's just a finite set, lots of cards, and I used to figure out a way to sort of access them randomly, and they still make sense. It's basically very similar in approach. To us imagining that we are moving around inside a finite set of episodes, hmm. and it just works, right? So that's also magic. It just had a different kind of magic. Right? That's also why I wanted to do card because cards are lends themselves much more easy to give ins, access points, affordances to reenact the story once you have them because they're kind of finite. They stay put, right? They don't change, right? The chat is better in a kind of in a, from a fluid lens, from a fluid perspective, because you can do these individual chat responses. You can sort of do the magic of translating your individual intention and communication skills right into the collective experience, right? But the individual, our typical individual chat response is kind of, wow, cool, or hi, or, I mean, it's, it's difficult to pass the depth of the participatory inquiry by just doing that, right? It's, if you can, if you really know what you're doing, and I've done that for a couple of years in a conversation with you, but for normal people, it's... Cool. I just said, wow, cool. <laughs> yeah, if you say, wow, cool, I mean, you can actually test it for a couple of months, and it actually works in Facebook, right? You can say, wow, cool, in every comment you ever do, <laughs> or you could choose another one. You could say, so it has come to this, exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> in every and it works right so facebook is kind of an, an distributed peer-to-peer -peer ai the whole thing but please don't tell the others that because they will be really disappointed because the other people thought that they were, they were actually chatting right? <laughs> and they're not right because it's a digital environment already right it, it's it's denatured it's it's virtually real so but anyway, back to the, the, the episodes. Uh, if we uh, test a couple of these things, if we just find out by experience that Alan, what's serving one or two cards per episode works just really great. W that doesn't work at all in Yasaragi, it works well in, 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 in not everything that we know, right? Some affordances will work better in like kindy and less so in others. And, and, and well, 
but we need to pick just a few knowledge expeditions to test these things it, because otherwise we will uh, the data points will be too scattered probably so uh, my good, suggestion good is, is the not knowledge the the, the 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 Mount Everest thing I think what for, for, uh, um, for testing purposes I think I mean for us as Sherpas I think Mount Everest well maybe it's, so yeah it, it's it's a solid metaphor climbing it requires group creativity group coherence a team effort uh, it's a sort of a finite thing right you start by cl the climbing when you get there and then you climb and then you climb down and then you're done it's um, and I would be I am curious to see how the randomness would what it would do and I don't mind having it delivered by Alan Watts it's an interesting twist on it and yeah I'd be curious to see how that works. I mean, I it, it because, it's I'm because it, it because for us to sort of enable us to just not draw cards, right? Well, to that just, point to too, just right? chat, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's, there's a thing we should check also with the terms of scripts, right? Because your came also kudos for your doing double and triple duty there, right? You do the code, you the script and then you also chat, right? So your your brain must be interesting to 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 measure right after a knowledge expedition, right? Because you have sort of done there's three Joachims having a chat with them within amongst themselves, right? In and during and after. Um, and but these are also things that are if that actually works and you're kind of living proof that you actually did it right so it obviously works right this is also goes into the whole thing of multitasking keeping track on multiple levels facing contingencies and managing them intelligently this goes into resilience and wellness dimensions mm. really well right which probably alice and the others have already explored right mm. so uh, basically how to sort of go through a knowledge expedition without going completely crazy it's 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 a really good metaphor right it's it's uh big that's what i found right i couldn't chat so at first i was obviously pissed about that right? really pissed i'm i'm one of those people that get pissed sometimes when i can't bloody chat right and the chat's the thing sort of in the i couldn't right i did once and the whole the whole laptop just froze right that's the worst thing a laptop browser could do to me when it freezes I'd rather it just starts to burn or something, but freezing <laughs> is kind of the worst, right? Because I can't just do, I can't do anything, right? <laughs> and it just sort of froze. I mean, there was a great scene of you guys. It's just, everything was just, okay, perfect cut, stop, freeze. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be great if I knew that it was a 15 second freeze. But you know, that's kind of round circly thingy that just goes on and on and on, right? That just mocks you, right? <laughs> but then I realized, hey, I could draw a card, right? Right, and that's that how just, you communicated. That, that just worked. So, I, yeah, I could sort of be present. So, uh, and that's a contingency if there ever was one. So, and then I remembered that, hey, I'm drawing cards and they are all drawn by random. So, they're kind of 100% contingency and I'm fine with that. So why am I not fine with these continuities, right? And that's a, quite a revelatory thing. So, um, and then I remember that we used to do in the old expeditions, burying people al alive under avalanches and all kinds of things, right? People falling down the kumbhais, full crack cracks and, and lots of things. We, it went dark and, and thing when we did the kind of the, the uh, Cambodian thing, uh, Angkor Wat. And, Obviously with moderation, but some of these things are, it just makes for a really great story. It's just that uh, Fleming said something really, really important. If we do measuring, obviously Alice will be happy with that. If we do field labs, research, uh, kind of field research and all that, right? And, and then we figure out a way to, to do something together with her. I mean, the whole validity of our thing. But when we go out in public, um, we need to stay as much away from the sort of feeling of lab rat or minion or, or 
uh, kind of crash test dummy or whatnot, right? We, we don't want participants to feel that, right? But we do want them to feel that tinge, right? That sort of, because uh, if everything just goes along perfectly and there's no snag, there's no snitch, there's no glitch, there's no nothing, they could have just done the PowerPoint presentation, right? And just click through and then, yeah, you're done, right? Mm. Yeah. I mean, so, so uh, but I think Ron said, said one of those crucial points earlier today that the, the observing this sort of six week delay, observing different time flows, right? And how they move along in their own trajectories. It's basically it's not, kind of how we can start to apply. Everything. So we actually sort of honor and work with the unfolding storyline. And we've already experienced that kind of Fleming just sort of tagged along, right? And some people have joined, have just joined. And then uh, Fernanda Ibarra just tagged along and she just loved every minute of the knowledge of nation without any previous knowledge whatsoever. And, and should, should we, we, we experienced lots and lots of these things, these things. Um, we obviously need also to tell Fleming if we go on the Mount Everest thing, we need to tell them, tell him a bit more of the context. Why is there a Lama temple right in the middle of Mount Everest? If we do do that part, right? <laughs> well, there is. Oh, yeah, it, it doesn't make. I mean, for us it makes perfect sense. For him, it might not. I mean, he's Fleming, right? So he would just think it's cool, right? But we could still tell him, right? So we could actually task ourselves, the three of us, to begin to sort of clue in Fleming on stuff that we sort of take for granted, but other participants couldn't possibly take this for granted because, and, and then we could basically also ask Fleming, the first time we go on Mount Everest, uh, we need to stop regularly so he can make notes. Because for him, it will be the absolute first time. And it's, it's such an invaluable thing, right? Because he has fresh eyes. He's kind of a multidimensional being already, right? So having him along for the first time, what does he experience? What does he see, right? But we can't stop for too long because, as he said, right, he goes out of character. He gets confused, right, because he, he, he's Fleming, right? He wants to do his very best at all times, and suddenly he wants to do it almost too well, right? So we can't do, okay, so let's do a two-hour lunch break with all the service and pause and things, and then we go to camp two. It's kind of, it will, it will ruin the whole thing, right? If we can figure out a way to sort of clue him in, which is actually the equivalent of helping him climb, right? Because we, we've done it, I don't know, if 10 times. We could climb Mount Everest in our sleep, possibly, right? But, but yeah. for him, it will be new, right? If it's feasible for all four of us, somehow, I think it would be great to do uh, something that spans three days. Yeah, three, three or four, yeah, exactly. Well, three or four days, yeah. Three is perfect. Yeah. Because like the six weeks plan and everything else I, it's just it's perfect and not only i tested it but howard roberts tested it years ago it's it, for like for a a function similar to like a seminar or something two days is too short four days is too long yeah hmm. i mean you're just taking my word for it at this point but i'm putting it out there I I've actually that. did i actually did with clients a one and a half day thing with cards, story map, road map, the whole works. And we did sort of a six month reverse imagineering experience in one and a half day. So my task was to compress six months that hasn't happened yet, six months into the future. And we started six months in the future and worked ourselves backwards. And we, we actually discovered that we needed to make pit stops. We needed to break camp now and then because our minds just told us, whoa, <laughs> now it's on overload. It's full up. I need I need coffee, right? Yeah. Sorry. How much time per How much time per day did you have? 
they just gave they just pay me for one and a half days so i had to to cram six months into one and a half days how many hours how many hours uh well six six plus one first day and then three a bit so nine ten hours in total right but it kind of was high quality high attendance high there was it was very i mean you yes, could do I mean, amazing with with ten hours of presence from a group. You can do amazing things, right? Mm. Because they were sort of they were staying put at one place. Uh, and well, the, uh, obviously, everything can't fit my three day plan. And no, I, I mean, that there's no, something universal about it, and it's also partly about biochemistry and neurology. Part of it. Yeah, I mean, in real life and in a sort of confined setting, one and a half day can actually work. But I need to sort of get rid of all the non-essentials. But in a virtual setting, three days is better. Because it's... Yeah, we, we, do, we do what we have to. So, but I'm no, just I mean, trying to make it... Because we, the, easiest, the easiest thing on Fleming, in the regard you were saying about bringing him on board, would be over a three-day period. Not necessarily a huge amount of time every day. It, it, here's my, my kind of field notes for why I said three days. Because... Yeah. Possibly, uh, we tend to make a bit more allowances for asynchronous interactions in digital because, and one of the reasons might actually be as simple as different time zones. Yeah. Which is probably why we need to set uh, sort of an expedition clock, right? Which says if it's morning or evening or because. We can just imagine, right, that we're sleeping more or less this time, right? We can obviously further down a couple of months later do, because that will also be amazing. We had a different knowledge expedition, different setting, and we actually work when we are awake, right? Because then we bring more of our real diurnal selves into an asynchronous virtual real environment, right? So, but for the first time, it's probably better to have us adapting to the Mount Everest clock, right? So we follow when it's morning in Mount Everest, it's morning when we do this three day thing. Right? So every, basically everyone wakes up when we are waking up and then we sort of tag. So it makes for better synchronous experiences, right? Even the asynchronous ones are cast in that light, no? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Which also means that we can obviously also add after action reviews as this one or journals and all kinds of more synchronous yep. after the fact experiences and things, right? But, um, and it, it would be kind of cool to also defining it, constraining it so, right? It starts first day noon and it ends Sunday morning or, or something. I mean, it's kind of, and we would know that beforehand, right? We had, we have to make an honest climbing effort, right? Within that time, which is very, that, that this is also why you, if, you, you, if you make an attempt to the top in Mount Everest, you know that you have clear weather for two days, if you're lucky, right? So you have to make that attempt that time or just forget about it and the metaphor here also is very strong in terms of concerted team efforts right and and lots of things right meetings conferences events what project management well, for, right? a, for a conference or a seminar yeah you know, in the last three days yeah so and, having the, the design you know, of the event and the experience be the main affordance for the coherence itself so we don't possibly even need to mention coherence because it's just a given fact that guys gentle participants yeah. please cohere right <laughs> so i guess when we can do this it would it might be good to do it and i do like the three-day plan for certain things even for the expeditions we had back when yeah it could have been done maybe in three days if we you know i don't know i did like the six days that's true and some of these things can just go on forever in some sense the people never quite lose each other no i mean actually we did right we did we started in 2014 i mean three of us plus hank right 
and three out of four are still at it kind of a couple of years later. So we did, right? And we don't fully hate each other yet, right? I, I don't think so. So we obviously did some things, right? Uh, but uh, we should begin to start with strategically two things, right? I mean, three things to weave in Fleming so we actually feel that it's he's one of us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one, kind of the whole community and team thing, right? The other is kind of the validity thing, which is important. And that mm -hmm. is a line of inquiry that would work really well for us together with not just the Milan team, but any which kind of researcher that we want to connect with, right? Mm -hmm. There's loads of different researchers now that are very, very into the whole virt virtual scene, right? And the more we understand about the virtual scene as a scene, it's, I mean, senders, right? The, the intelligence of the whole scene is mm -hmm. us and all the others who are doing similar things. I mean, Jonathan Belil and lots, loads of others, right? So that's the second thing that is important. And then our ongoing testing and offering knowledge expeditions to actually have a working and monetizable support system that evolves with our enacting it. Right? That's actually why I called it enact the men support systems. I needed to call it something, right? I couldn't just call it John's magic cards and a bag of tricks, right? I mean, that's, that would actually be a more true name, but that wouldn't actually say <laughs> anything to you guys, right? But the context, because those 12 cards I drew now, you can draw additional cards by random and they will begin to query. Actually, you will begin now to query the Senus as a service beginning constellation of a structure inside the field. So uh, this is part of the magic, right? I, Ron, I already know if you would draw cards randomly, you would sort of rediscover particular characteristics of the grid that you already see, you already notice, right? And Joachim, if you would draw cards still at random, you would begin to uh, find dimensions around scripts, code, cognitive data structures. Now I won't spoil the surprise because I can't really tell you because it's, it's after, as a fact, it is random, right? I don't know with precision. If it would be your first, second, or third card, I actually don't know. It could be the fifteenth card, for all I know, right? But I would, I, I do know that you would uh, start to tease out these things, right? And that's also why I wanted to have it around three hundred fifty, four hundred cards, because I just didn't know how large a set I needed, right? Mm. And I mean, I do know three hundred sixty from compasses and, 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 and maps and, and, and whatnot, right? So that metaphor I do know quite a bit about. And it's also in the knowledge expedition, it's kind of main navigation, right? Compasses and maps. So it, the metaphor works on a very, very deep level. But uh, let's do that once we have figured out one or two more things about how to begin to weave together uh, the group creativity cards inside an expedition. Yes. Right. So it becomes less of a kind of anomaly, kind of weird, weird thing just appearing seemingly not connected with all the other things. Right? Good. So, Let's do that. Okay, guys. Lunch is calling. Yep. Yeah. Uh, excellent session as always. Um, what, Alice? I actually don't know what Alice under Alice's definition of an action and activity and enactment, that would be really handy. We would have some shared sort of mm. kind of, we could go to a book, right? But I would prefer to actually ask her, Alice, would you give us the, how is your current understanding in, for, from you and your team? What's this inactive intersubjectivity, enactment and action and embodied cognition and whatnot, right? And I mean, I think she would just be happy to tell us, right? We sometimes forget that we can ask people these sort of dead simple things and they can just clue us in on what they think about these things, right? Hmm. 
So I would like to learn more of that directly and indirectly. And uh, yeah. I'm also not sure about, I already have a somehow a slight impression about Alice because I did meet her in the environment and uh, they would just, so I don't know, but I'm, st I'm not so sure that she's entirely on the box side of that spectrum. I think she might have some of more of the even fairly wildly improvisational side going for herself as well. Exactly. I mean, it, it was a good data point that Fleming said that she's, she's a good singer, right? Right. Yeah, so, that's probably yeah. why I, because I heard her singing and you, when you hear somebody sing, you hear something about them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so she might not be as cold and calculating as you might think for the situation she's working with. No, I mean, good then. goodness, she, she's, she's Italian. She's almost an ideal academic, academic <laughs> person for us to meet, right? Because they, they, um, not that there would be anything wrong with having a Swedish and or a German academician, right? It's just that they would be decidedly more boring and more structured. <laughs> I mean, they, they would. I met tons of them, right? Not not to say that Joachim and me are boring, but German Swedish ac academicians are, as a general rule, pretty darn boring. Um, they're kind of like Vulcans, right? Kind of, they are logical. So, which obviously also is interesting in a kind of an indirect way, right? Kind of to see if you can endure. Uh, but uh, but yeah. objectively, they are doing tons of really uh, interesting research in that whole Milan team, right? So, and they sort of discovered learning journeys through virtual realms from a completely different direction than, than we did, right? I guess so. So, I mean, the whole Gagioli book reads as a, extended instruction manual for how you wayfind in the virtual real realm by mm -hmm. presence and social presence and intention and group creativity and network flows. So it's kind of, whoa, right? How on earth did they discover that? Mm -hmm. Did they do knowledge of business? No, they just did mm -hmm. service, which is kind of actually quite amazing, right? It's kind of like, kind of like Neo, right? So they're looking at tons of code and suddenly they see these things, right? Mm. That's also an interest. I mean, that, that question needs to wait. I can't ask Alice exactly on a scale how weird are you to have discovered this, these amazing things, right? I mean, I sometimes get away with asking these questions to people. I mean, but not always, right? But let's not sort of start there, right? Let's build some yeah. common ground, right? Um, right. But they are they are out there, right? If 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 an academician does an active intersubjectivity in biosensors for a living, they are pretty weird, right? As academicians go, right? So we don't need to fear, uh, but we do need to pursue. So she understands what we want to do, right? And if we want to yeah. sort of say, hey, we want to see what we can sort of fruitfully, meaningfully explore together with you guys, right? Yeah. Uh, and if she knows that, then we need to ask her so she can start to clue us in. Right? Mm. So, um, but I would love to do the census thing, right? The whole running out of oxygen, going to the meditation tent, getting the oxygen replenished, I mean, imagine if this actually works, right? We, we, could, we could sell this, right? It's a, it's a really, really meaningful service, right? Because then we can add knowledge petitions that are adds continuously, right? Suddenly everything just malfunctions. I mean, and then, then actually it doesn't just happen. It just, we did it, we designed it so it shouldn't, right? <laughs> Sometimes we get lucky and everything is just glitches, right? Just by nature, right? But we can mm -hmm. actually design so this appears as if glitches, right? And people get worried and people get anxious and then off to the oxygen tent, right? And do some <laughs> meditation, right? So, and I, I can see this, I mean, this is also really brilliant and also very unique 
I mean, we get paid then to, to, to create, in, induce anxiety in our clients, right? Which is, <laughs> which is what, what I actually did for a couple of years as a leadership consultant. <laughs> that paid really well, actually. So I, I, I'm a natural on those <laughs> situations. Right? So, uh, cool. So, All but right. that, and anyway, yeah. that, this was a brilliant, and, and we, we, um, let you off for getting some, some lunch or whatever the time is at your, your place. But, um, yeah, I'm ready for, I had a protein bar, but I need something more now. Yeah. I need to do some dinner, I think. Um, anyway, um, good. Yep. I need to next week. I'll be, I'm going back to Ari now, so I'll be off for a week. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, we can continue. You guys can meet, but, uh, I'll be back, uh, the week after. Have a good one, Jorkin. Yeah. And, and good travel. Yeah. Thank you. Mad waves, waves. and see you soon. <laughs> see you soon. Bye cheers. Bye. Cheers.